Awesome family, welcome to church. Hey, I'm excited to be bringing the word of the Lord to you today. Whether you are watching in the morning or in the evening, really this is going to be a great experience that we're going to have together with God. But I want to remind you that we don't just put these videos together to put them on YouTube or on church online for you to just watch with your family and just sit back and relax. No, this is church for us. We want you to be engaged with us. We want you to know that we, we come prepared, our leaders come prepared, we are prayed up because we want to engage and enjoy God with you. We also want to make sure that you are growing in God, that you are connected in community. And so if you're watching this and you don't belong to one of our online connect groups, I'm asking you right now, if you could just let us know in the YouTube comment section or on Church Online, just click on, I want to get connected. And some of our leaders will attend to you right now and get you connected and get you growing in God. It's important for us that that happens with you so that it doesn't just remain an online experience, but we want to get together as a community and keep growing together. And so I'm continuing today with the series that we started with Pastor Carol three weeks ago and really was great. Last week, Pastor Carol was talking about the, the, the power of praise and really just what, what praise and our ability to praise God would bring for us and do for us. And the week before, Pastor Andrew was talking about the power of prayer, really understanding and shared the different revivals and just understanding the power that we have in prayer. And so today I'm going to continue with the same theme. And really the, the message I would love to get across today is knowing who you are in God. And so I'll, 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 I'll give you a title for today as the power of identity all right so the series again as a reminder is undefeated the secret life of warriors and so today i've got two warriors that i want to bring to you one is a bible character and another one is really our contemporary champion that some of you might know and others of you might not know his name is tyson fury his story really intrigued me and interested me as i was preparing for this sermon so, uh, uh, Tyson Fury in 2016, when he was still a champion in boxing, he decided because he was struggling with depression and he was on the verge of, of taking his own life, he was taking drugs, he was really struggling with his health. And so he decided that he was going to give up his uh, title so that he could focus on his health. And so he gave up his titles as world uh, boxing heavyweight champion in 2016 to focus on his health. Two years later, he came back in 2018 to fight one of the biggest fights of his life. And he was fighting one of really the greatest contemporary heavyweight fighter by the name of Deontay Wilder. In fact, I was reading an interesting article about Deontay Wilder that he is ranked as the hardest hitting heavyweight champion ranked above Mike Tyson and George Foreman. So this guy is vicious. This guy is strong. His punches are hard. And so Deontay Wilder got into the ring with uh, Tyson Fury in December 2018. It was an anticipated fight. The road leading to the fight was exciting. A lot of people stayed up at night to watch the game, or right, to watch the fight. And so as the fight continued, it was a great fight to watch. Uh, Tyson Fury was knocked down once, and then he was knocked down twice in round 12 of the boxing match. When he was knocked down in round 12, everybody thought he was done and he was gone, because whilst he was lying down, he looked like he really had passed out. And so the ref started counting, as some of you might know, in boxing, you are only given 10 seconds to stay down. And if you don't get up after the 10 seconds, the game is over. And so the ref starts to count one, two, three, and gets to nine. Some analysts said the ref counted at 9.9 .9 seconds. And then Tyson Fury got up and continued the fight. That fight ended in a draw, which secured a rematch for him in 2020. And in 2020, it was one of the greatest anticipated, or one of the most anticipated fights in boxing. And it happened, I think, in March or February of 2020 where Tyson Fury was able to defeat Deontay Wilder in the seventh round when the Deontay Wilder's camp threw in the towel as a sign that their boxer was hurting too much. 
Why am I sharing this story of a, of a contemporary boxing champion who is undefeated currently in the world of boxing? Some of you might know him, some of you might not. The reason why I'm sharing is because this is talking about undefeated. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 from verse 8, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Really, this is Paul's description of what undefeated looks like. And this is the story of Tyson Fury. At the press conference, the, 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 one of the journalists asked him and said, Tyson Fury, you looked like you were already gone in round 12 when you were punched by Deontay Wilder. Why did you get up? He says, a hand came upon me and helped me up to continue the fight. Because the, uh, the, the journalist knows that Tyson Fury is a Christian and so he went on to tease him and said, hey, do you think that Jesus extended his hand and got you up to continue the fight. He says, I think so. I think Jesus extended his hand and got me up to continue the fight. Here's the appeal that I want to make to you today, family. For some of you, maybe you, you love the, the status of being undefeated. You love the idea of becoming an undefeated champion in your industry. But you have lost the appetite to be in the ring. You have lost the desire to be in the ring. And listen, let me tell you this family, that there is a correlation between being undefeated and being in the ring. And the tragedy sometimes for us as Christians when we are going through a series like this is that all of us are, are, are for being champions that are undefeated, but no one wants to put their gloves on and get into the ring. Paul describes that we are knocked down. Maybe, maybe you're feeling like that. Maybe you're feeling like you've been in the ring and life has knocked you down in round one and then knocked you down in round two. But let me tell you, one of the most remarkable things that you can do when you are in the ring is to just get up and keep going. Is to just get up and keep going. And that's how we remain undefeated. And so today I'm going to introduce us to another, I think one of my contemporary biblical character hero who I feel was so undefeated in his resilience, in his pursuit of God, in his pursuit of the mission that God had on his life. And that guy is Peter. And so I'm going to read his, his letter to a church that was scattered and then I'll give us an introduction of the man himself. All right. First Peter chapter two from verse uh, nine it says here, 1 Peter chapter 2 from verse 9, it says here, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. And so Peter is a mature Peter who's writing this letter. He has experienced life. He's been in prison and he understands somehow what suffering means. At one point, he was beaten almost to death, but he got up again. And Peter understands, in fact, in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, the Bible says that after the Holy Spirit had come upon the disciples that were in the upper room, as they came down speaking in tongues, and, and the people were wondering, like, why are these guys speaking in foreign languages? In fact, some of them, we can hear them in our own native languages. Another part of the crowd started saying, no, but these guys are drunk. Why, why are you drunk? Why couldn't you wait to have your gin and tonic at least late after work? Why did you have to be drunk at 12 o'clock in the afternoon? And so Peter, with his, in his pursuit and quest to, to try and defend his people, that, hey guys, listen, these people are not as drunk as you suppose. In fact, these people are just filled by the Holy Spirit. And then he went on to explaining 
from the book of the prophet Joel how the Holy Spirit was promised and that was the fulfillment of that promise. At the end of his argument, guess what? 3,000 people got saved. He probably was so surprised because his initial intention wasn't to get people saved. It was just to say, hey guys, listen. Myself and other disciples, we were not drinking. We were just filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is the Peter who almost drowned. When Jesus came to them as they were struggling to keep the boat going because of the raging waters. And Peter saw Jesus with the other disciples from far and they thought it was a ghost. And they, Peter says, hey Jesus, if that's you, command me to come to you. And Peter started walking on water. And when, when he took his eyes off Jesus, he began to drown. I mean, how can Peter begin to drown? I think Peter was a Galilean boy. He wasn't like a Joburg guy who grew up in Joburg where we have no, you know, we don't have the sea like the people in Cape Town and Durban and all of those other coastal towns. He was a Galilean boy. He grew up at the sea. He was a fisherman. He probably tried multiple times to swim to stay afloat, but he couldn't until Jesus extended his hand to bring him up. And this is the Peter who was who had given his life to follow Jesus. Literally, he gave up everything. And only to come to a place where he was so beaten down, so disappointed. He even denied Jesus three times. And history says that Peter was not even present at the cross when Jesus was being crucified. Because he was so disappointed, he was down, beaten by life. But one thing about Peter, he wasn't out. He was down, but he wasn't out. And so Peter's writing this later. He's writing this letter to a church that is scattered. The church is scattered because of persecution. And this persecution was, was an unusual persecution because uh, it, history says that during this time, the reigning emperor was Emperor Nero. And this emperor was, was ferocious. He was vicious against Christians. History goes as far as saying that this guy murdered his own mother. He, he conspired to, to burning down the city of Rome so that he would rebuild, he, he would build rather his own palace. Because the Senate wouldn't let him build the palace. And when he did burn the city of Rome, what he did was that he said to the people that it's the Christians that burned that city. And so the persecution became even more fierce against Christians. And this guy, this is what he would do. He would, he, would, he would put animal skin on Christians and feed them to ferocious animals. He would burn Christians on the stake and use them as, as, as torches for the night for his personal entertainment. And so Peter is writing to a people that is hopeless. A people that is wondering, where is God in the midst of everything that is happening? He's writing to people like myself and you who had families, who had brothers, who had sisters, but yet they were scattered and some of them were scattered away from their families. Some of them were, had left their work. Some of them had left their businesses, their farms, their fields. And these people were scattered for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the gospel. And Peter is writing to them because he's wanting them to understand certain things that in the midst of adversity and trouble, when you feel like in your heart there is no more hope to continue the journey of life. When you feel like life has just beaten you so much such that the energy to continue the journey is gone. And Peter is wanting them to understand certain things. I could almost feel in this appeal that Peter is making in 1 Peter 2.9, almost shaking off the, hopeless, uh, the hopelessness out of them. He's saying to them, listen, I want you to know that you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. God's own special people. This is almost the identical words that, that God spoke to the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt in Exodus 19. When they didn't know who they were, when they were scared and afraid of their enemy who seemingly was stronger than them. 
when they were in despair about the future of their children, really not knowing what they're going to do next because they found themselves in the wilderness, the only thing they had was the promise that God gave them through Moses. And God used almost these identical words at Mount Sinai to Moses. and said, Go tell my people that they are mine. They are chosen people. Three things that Peter wanted the church that was scattered to understand. One is that you are chosen, that your position in God is secure. Secondly, he wanted them to understand their mission, that you are royal priests. And thirdly, he wanted them to understand that they had a relationship with God, that they were God's own people, that they belonged to God. It's important. See, these are the things that describe our real identity. It's our position. It's our mission. And it's our relationship. You know when you are when you are when you want to discover your direction when you're lost, what do you look out for? You look out for where you are first, your position. And sometimes the view of life becomes distorted when we lose the position of where we are. And Peter wanted them to come back to understanding, hey guys, in order for you to shift your eyes above your troubles, in order for you to see beyond your persecution, it's important that you discover what your position is in God. And I feel like today you're watching, maybe, maybe you're unemployed. Maybe you've just received the letter from, from, your, from your company that you're going to be retrenched or you're going to get a salary cut. Maybe you are behind in payment of your car or your house. Or maybe your children are home and you, just, you are just not coping with the fact that you have to combine work with homeschooling. Maybe you are just feeling and you are battling with depression because life is becoming too overwhelming. And you are feeling too overwhelmed and too burdened by just the affairs of life. And you're watching this and you're questioning yourself and you're wondering, hey God, where are you in all of this? And here's a message that God is bringing to you this morning. Hey, your position in God is secure. You are a chosen person. When you find your position in God, you begin to change your view because when you see where you are, you can see from where you are. And if from where you are is a wrong position, whatever you see becomes wrong. If your position is not correct, your direction can be incorrect. And so Peter wanted them to understand their position in God. And the second thing Peter wanted to understand, which is critical for their identity, is the fact that they have a mission that has eternal significance. That it's a mission like no other mission. Like, yeah, maybe your job right now is not giving you that missional thrust. Maybe you're feeling like your life carries no mission, no purpose, nothing. Maybe you're feeling like you're useless. Maybe you are a tradesman or a tradeswoman. Or, or you, you own the business that kind of defined who you were and defined your mission in life. But now that nothing else is working because we are in lockdown, because of COVID-19, you are feeling like you have no more mission on your life. And let me remind you, there's a mission on your life that carries an eternal significance. And that mission is the fact that you are a royal priest, that God literally has called you as one that would stand before him on behalf of the people that do not know him and call them into the kingdom. That is the greatest mission that you can ever have on your life. The people for whom Jesus gave up his life, are the ones that God has given you responsibility over to reconcile back to himself. And that's the mission that you have on your life. And thirdly, Peter wanted them to understand, hey, you belong to God. And I feel like this morning, I want to speak to the lonely. You are feeling alone, man. You're feeling like, like, like nobody understands the degree of your loneliness. You cook for yourself, you bath for yourself, you drink for yourself, you wash dishes for yourself, and then you cook again for yourself. And you try to explain to people how lonely you are, but nobody can understand. But let me tell you this morning, family, you belong to God. You belong to God. You are God's 
own special possession. That your relationship in God is unbreakable. And that's what you have. Why is it important that we understand these three things? Why is it important that we understand our position? Well, our position defines and determines our direction. Our position determines the view that we have because our standpoint will determine our vantage point. And so our mission defines our purpose, the reason and the motivation and the drive we have when we wake up every day and go to work and live life because we understand, although nothing else might be working, but I'm on a mission for God. And thirdly, your relationship, man, when everybody around you seems not to want you, when you feel unwanted, when you feel rejected and ostracized by people, let me reassure you that you have a relationship with God and nothing can break that relationship that you have with God. And so Peter wanted them to understand these things because he knew that if they would understand this, they would overcome their persecution. Because in the midst of trouble, the enemy comes after your identity. When you're going through adversity, the enemy comes and begins to whisper to you that you are not good enough. That you don't have what it takes. That you cannot achieve the dreams and aspirations that God has placed on your heart. That the hope for your children's future is no longer there because of what's happening around you. The enemy comes and begins to whisper things to your ears so that he can take away the sense of identity that you have in God. And Peter wanted them to understand these things. Why is it important that today we need to understand these things? Two points I have for you for those who are writing and then we're going to close. The first one is that your, your ability to love other people is a function of your self-love. In, in Matthew uh, chapter 22, verse 36 to 40, Jesus makes a remarkable statement. Someone, a young man came to ask him, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. One of the greatest commandments is your ability to love your neighbor as you love yourself. In other words, you cannot love your neighbor more than you love yourself. Therefore, the, your, your, your ability to love others is a function of your self-love. Let me say it in another way. That when you are dissatisfied and unfulfilled with your own life, you run the risk of being jealous for other people's successes. When you feel like you cannot celebrate who you are, the gifts and the talents, the skills that you have, you run the risk of being jealous and not celebrating the success of other people because you're not fulfilled in your own self. And so Jesus places the onus on us that, hey, listen, you might think that you are able to love your family. You might think that you are able to love your spouse, your children, or your parents. You might think that you are, you'll be able to love your friends or people around you without loving yourself. See, that's deception at the highest level. You can only love others to the same degree that you love yourself or to a lesser degree that you love yourself. And so Jesus places that as one of the two greatest commandments. That the function, the, your ability to love other people is a function of your self-love. And the second point is this. And I've seen this so too many times in life. Is that you cannot outlive your self-portrait. You cannot live beyond the frame that you have drawn for your own life. Whether explicitly or implicitly. Whether knowingly or unknowingly, you continuously live life in accordance to what you think you are worth or how much you think you deserve. And so in order for you to shift your paradigm, your paradigm in terms of how much you are worth, you've got to go back to understanding what your position is in God, what your mission is in God, and what your relationship in God is. And once you discover that, then you can come back and say, man, I am worth. The life of Jesus. There's a story in Judges 6, which is quite fascinating. It's a story 
of a man called Gideon. Gideon, at this time, they were invaded by the Midianites. And so he was at the threshing floor trying to thresh wheat. He was, the Bible says he was afraid because he was trying to do it quickly so that he could go and hide it from the Midianites. At the point of his desperation, at the point of his hopelessness, at the point where he probably was wondering, I'm going to hide this lest these guys come and take it because this is the meal that is supposed to be for my family. And he's in fear, he's doing this. You can imagine. Because when you look at the conversation that he had with an angel, you can try to understand the pain that was in his heart. He asked questions like, if God is really with us, why have all these things happened to us? If God is really with us, why are we going through the things that we are going through? Maybe that's the question you're asking yourself. If God is really there, if God is really with us, if God is really in my family, in my business, if God is really there, I've prayed enough times for God to show up. If God is really there, why have all these things happened to us? And the angel of the Lord said to him, Gideon, go in the might that you have. Go in the strength that you have. Perhaps Gideon was expecting that the Lord or the angel of the Lord was going to tell him more than what he'd already given him. Let me remind you this morning, family, as I close. You have what it takes to achieve the mission that God has on your life. You are worth the very life of Jesus. And once you begin to understand how much you are worth in God, You'd begin to live life and say to everybody, I might not have what social society, what society requires. I might not have what my neighbor has. I might not have the, the, the latest car that my friend has. But what I have is that I am worth the life of Jesus. That I was good enough that Jesus would die on the cross for me. That I was good enough that God would think of me and send Jesus Christ to come and die on the cross for me. Once you understand that you are worth the life of Jesus, that ought to change the way you live your life. That, that ought to change the way you think about yourself, the way you think about your family, the way you think about your job. And so in conclusion, in order for us to be undefeated, in our industries, to be undefeated in our lives, in order for us to remain and keep the status of undefeated champions, it is important for us to understand our position in God, our mission in God, and our relationship with God. Once we understand those three things, then we know that we can outlive life and its boundaries over us. And we know that we can be able to love the way God wants us to love. And if you know in your heart that you have never really made a real decision and commitment to follow Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I'm launching this invitation. We've got leaders right now praying with you and praying for you, waiting for you to make this decision so that we can reach out to you and walk this journey with you. And so if you're watching on YouTube, please type in the comment section that I would love to commit my life to Jesus. Or there's a form that has been posted now, a link to a form that you can click on and, 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 and get hold of us. Or if you're watching on church online platform, you can click on I commit my life to Jesus for you to join us in this journey with Jesus. Hey, come on, pray this prayer with me if you have made that decision. Say, Lord Jesus, today I repent of my sins. And I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I commit myself to walking this life with you. In Jesus' name, amen.